Hello everyone, welcome to Urban U. I'm Abby Ashola. On this episode, feminist icon Bella Abzug, as remembered by her daughter Liz. The World According to Fanny Davis, a fascinating new memoir that's caught the attention of Hollywood, and how one grad student is using Twitter to document Black American history in New York. Those stories and more, but first. Before Hillary and AOC, there was Bella. She was a lawyer, activist, and former Hunter grad. Congresswoman Bella Abzug ran for office for the first time in 1970. But before then, she had been at the forefront of every important movement from the 50s up until her passing in 1998. Because of the killing of the spirit and the meaning and the belief of American democracy, that I do impeach the president of the United States. So it was wild, it was wild. Her campaign office was in the old Village Voice headquarters in the village. She brought in celebs like Barbara Streisand, Lily Tomlin, Shirley MacLaine, Harry Belafonte. It was really an intense campaign. Day and night, day and night, you know, she ran 18 hour days and she defeated a 13 year incumbent. I'm Liz Abza. I am the founder and executive director of the Bella Abzug Leadership Institute, and I'm Bella Abzug, former congresswoman's daughter. Bella won that seat shopping bag by shopping bag. She stood outside of stores in Greenwich Village in the Lower East Side, and she gave out shopping bags that said, carry Bella to Congress. She had a slogan that was absolutely perfect. This woman's place is in the House, the House of Representatives. That was the answer to anybody who thought it was not a woman's turn to have this seat. No congressional seat belongs to anyone. It belongs only to the people. I'm Harold Holzer. I'm the director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College. And uh, I was Bella Abzug's press secretary from 1975 until, well, officially uh, 1978, but sort of for life. Bella had her first brush with gender inequity uh, when her beloved father died. And she went to the synagogue to say the prayer for the dead, the Kaddish, on a daily basis and uh, confronted a synagogue of old bearded men who did not think a, a woman should be counted as one of the 10 men that made it possible to conduct an official service. And she wouldn't leave. And they sort of decided to let her stay so that was her brush as a youngster with breaking down barriers. My mother, she was asked in 1945 to represent a black man named Willie McGee in the South in Mississippi who was accused of raping a white woman who he was having a consensual relationship with. When she went down there, she often couldn't get a hotel room. So actually one night she sat up in a bus station in the stall of a women's bathroom uh, in order to go to court the next day to, you know, argue the case. Another time she was eight months pregnant when she was representing him and uh, she actually had a miscarriage from all the pressure because the Klan was after her. There's a lot of hostility that's informed everything she did the rest of her life. She was influential because she was a leader. She was a maker of coalitions to get real legislation. You know, it wasn't just Public Works, it was Freedom of Information Act. We haven't talked about LGBTQ right and her enormous impact on that movement. It was a very exciting time for women uh, in the second wave of feminism in the beginning. It was a lot of protests, a lot of action. My mother was very active in the Congress, introducing fundamental bills to support it, the Equal Credit Act. In the old days, you couldn't get a credit card if you were a single woman. They were building a movement. I got a call in 1975 and I asked Bella, are you gonna run for the Senate? And she said, yes, and you'll be my press secretary. She ran a great campaign. She only lost by nine tenths of a percent, 9,000 votes out of a million. Many people think that, you know, if she had stayed in the house without not run for the Senate, she would have been there for the rest of her life and, you know, gained great seniority. But my mother felt it's ridiculous. We gotta break this Senate. There is not even one woman among the 100 U.S. senators. The loss was devastating. It was probably the hardest loss and in her life. And it was, I, that night, I never saw my mother cry really about something professionally or politically. She cried in the, you know, the, in the hotel room we were waiting. I would say the sad thing is she really wanted to go back to Congress. 
it was heartbreaking because she still thought she could make a difference in Congress. But finally, in 86, she turned to international environmental economic activity. She was a groundbreaker in that. She helped create the Women's Environmental Development Organization, an NGO at the United Nations. She was still living these milestone moments and not, you know, not just taking accolades and, and you know, basking in the glory of this movement that had expanded from the kitchens and parlors of women in the 60s to a global conference in China. She was trying to make a difference. She was willing to stand up, stand for her principles, and I created something to carry on her legacy, the Bell Labs of Leadership Institute. And the legacy is that you can do it, that you as a woman, no matter what your background, no matter what your race, no matter what your socioeconomic status, you can fight for what is due to you. And you can do it, you must do it. Our next story focuses on Black American history in New York City. One grad student from Hunter College has found a clever way to document his interests by using archival video and photos on his Twitter account. Take a look. Sola Olasunde is a graduate student at Hunter College studying urban planning. Urban planning is somewhat of a contemporary solution to the problems of history. I was into urban history and I saw how cities ended up declining and how cities ended up coming back, but it wasn't an equitable comeback. The son of Nigerian immigrants, his love for history was fostered while spending time with his father, listening to him reminisce on New York City's past. He used to talk to me about um, like his first experiences in New York City. When we used to <laughs> ride around places in Manhattan, he would be like, wow, this place looks so different. I remember when I first came here, it used to be horrible, run down. There used to be like so much crime, just talking about how bad the city became. And that's how I ended up getting really, really, really into history. Those conversations with his father were instrumental in him turning his interest for history from a hobby into a passion. He now uses Twitter as a way to tell pieces of New York history through sharing archival images and videos that connect people with the city's past. And then Sola posted an archival video from a 1976 episode of the Bill Moyers Journal titled Rosedale, The Way It Is. And then I posted one clip, some black kids having a racist encounter with some white kids. And that went viral, very viral. White people start saying, get out of here, niggas. You know, get out of my neighborhood. Don't come to this name. Then they start punch hitting on her. Yeah, I was just glad that there's finally proof. Like, there's something that we can actually see, and it's undeniable just seeing how people were treated when they were moved, when they moved into white neighborhoods. And even my father was telling me when he first got here that there's parts of New York you just don't go to because you're black. The Rosedale clip caught the attention of the New York Times where they sought out and published an article interviewing the victims of the racist attack. They gave Sola an honorable mention and then decided to reach out and do an article on him. A journalist from the Times was just like, oh, I really like what you're doing. I want to write a story on you. I want to pitch it to my editor. They shot me like around my house and the article was made. I didn't expect it to be like this whole like two page thing in the Sunday paper. But that's I'm very flattered. And I mean, it feels surreal. The New York Times also couldn't help but to notice his eclectic New York swag. Black New York, that's like what I care about in terms of style. Like style here was like a big thing growing up. And then when I started researching style, like Black New York style through the years, I kind of like just was taking from different places, you know, the Kangol, the Wallabies, the permanent press pants. New York also has the most diverse and global black population of any American city, 
that boasts a large number of Caribbean and African immigrants that have deeply impacted the culture here. So why does Sola, a first-generation child of Nigerian parents, specifically focus on the Black American experience? I feel like immigrants are starting to take the main stage and like pe people are kind of actually starting to forget the contributions that Black Americans made to New York. Like, if it wasn't for them, they you, you kind of wouldn't be thriving in the way that you are. They created the blueprint for everything like that we know as Black New York culture. Sola says that in general, when people come to visit his Twitter page, he wants them to learn something new about New York. I don't want people necessarily to see my stuff and feel as if I'm indoctrinating people because I'm not really doing that. I'm just sharing the things that I feel should need to be shared. Your stance on certain solutions is gonna change if you know the history that I know. And if you don't, cool. As long as you know what I know, that's fine with me. Sola is currently working on a book about Black New York history and several other projects that he'll announce in the near future. Until then, you can find him on Twitter at Drink Sola Pop, sharing pieces of New York history. For Urban U, this is Eddie Bailey. An underground business in 1960s Detroit, the world according to Fannie Davis. After years of keeping her mother's profession a secret, Baruch College professor Bridgette Davis shares her mother's story in her new memoir. I spoke to her about the book and about Hollywood's interest in her mother's gripping tale. It's pretty hard to describe a woman like my mom in a few words. She was a force. Fanny Davis was self-possessed and beautiful and dynamic and charismatic and beloved. Baruch College professor Bridgette Davis paints the same vivid picture of her mother in her memoir titled, The World According to Fanny Davis, My Mother's Life in the Detroit Numbers. According to Davis's account, her mother was a sharp and fair businesswoman who created a prosperous life for herself and her family in the Motor City in the 1960s. Her line of work, the numbers racket, an illegal gambling business, yes, and yet she never got caught and she never folded. So let's back up a little bit. How did she get started in the numbers? My mom and dad did what millions of Black folks did. They migrated north, in their case, from Nashville to Detroit in the late 50s. And they did it with three small children. They had the same motivation so many Black folks had. They wanted civil liberties and to get out from up under all of those Jim Crow laws. They were a nightmare to live up under. So that's what they were escaping. My mom had no idea that she was going to be facing poverty when she got to Detroit. She was stunned. And that's why she started looking for, as she loved to say, a way out of no way. The numbers are simply a precursor to the lottery that we all know about. Lotteries were not legal in this country for a long time until the late 60s and early 70s. And so prior to that, people played this underground game that was also a lottery, it just wasn't legal. That same game that came to be known as the numbers was invented in the 1920s by Casper Holstein, a black man who ruled the Harlem scene at the time. And so it is a quintessentially black created phenomenon. A phenomenon indeed. In 1963, the Detroit numbers racket alone climbed to a $15 million a year enterprise. But the government had begun its crackdown on the underground business well before then, leading to the arrest of many numbers runners in Detroit and other major cities like New York. Again, Fannie remarkably had never been caught. She did, however, face a huge dip in her business by the time the state of Detroit chose to legalize the lottery and control it. The more the lottery impinged, the less people felt they could trust the numbers. The less they patronized them, the weaker street numbers became. Given this reality, Mama had a brainstorm, offered customers options to play the lottery with her 
play the traditional numbers as always, or play a combination of both. She later said that the idea came to her while on a trip to Las Vegas. She was standing at a roulette table, watching the dealer rake in players' piles and piles of chips when it dawned on her, you can never beat the house. Another thought quickly followed, if you can't beat them, join them. Why not make the state and its daily the new operator for her numbers business? In a very short time, Mama did away with the streets winning numbers altogether and exclusively used the lottery's daily winners. She also offered incentives like higher payouts than the state's lottery winnings, a brilliant move that many other numbers runners in the area adopted soon after. She maintained her success in the business until she fell ill with cancer and died in 1992. Her wealth from the numbers became the legacy that helped Davis and her husband purchase a home in Brooklyn. Davis's memoir marks the first time she discussed her mother's profession with anyone outside of her family while growing up in Detroit, in part because of the stigma that came with the illegal game. My mother always made it clear the numbers was a legitimate business that just happened to be illegal. And some people like to go to their Catholic church basements and play bingo for money. The whole, you know, horse racing industry is about betting. No one judges that. So it really is this question of how are you determining what's, what's okay and what's not? And what are the racial undertones? Davis is hard at work on writing the script for the film adaptation for her memoir, which she says is new and difficult territory. But she forges ahead with the lessons her mother taught her about how to move in the world. Calculated risks are a good thing. So I have often bet on myself at very key moments in my life. And I now know I got that from my mom. She was betting on herself. When you hear the name Batgirl, you may think of a crime-fighting superhero swinging through Gotham, vanquishing evil. But it's also the nickname of a CUNY alumna, Dr. Susan Sang, who travels the world studying bats. Our own Andrew Falzone spoke to her about her work. I work on bat evolution and conservation, and most of my work is in collaboration with folks who also work on disease ecology. And Susan Sang's work has taken her to the far reaches of the globe. She's a research associate for the American Museum of Natural Science and History. In 2020, she was recognized by the U.S. State Department after she received the Aspire Prize from the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Group for Excellence in Scientific Research and Cooperation with Regional Science in the South Pacific. The bats that she studies are unique because of their size. So I focus on this group called flying foxes, which are these really, really big bats. They are about like the size of my forearms. It's like a foot long almost. So most of the bats here in the United States are pretty tiny. They're like the size of your fist. She started studying them during her graduate years because of what makes them so unique. So bats are the only true flying mammals. The other mammals that are called like flying, like flying lemurs or flying squirrels, they're actually just gliding. Bat wings are like, if you had your hand and your fingers got really long and there's webbing in between it, right? So like it, it does this to make a shape. It doesn't just do like a straight line. And so the way that you fly is really different because now you can pivot or you can um, respond to things that are coming at you in a different way. And while the idea of touching a bat may creep you out, Susan says that fear is mostly unfounded. They're not all bloodsuckers. There's over 1,400 species of bats in the world, and only three of them are vampire bats. They are only found in Central and South America, so they're not even near most people. And while they may not be nature's cutest critters, there are still other misconceptions about bats, especially since the scientific community believes that the virus that causes COVID-19 came from a bat population. Just because of the way that their bodies are built, they are able to basically tolerate having viruses at a low load and not spend the energy to get rid of them because it's not worth their time. Whereas like if we had something floating in us, our immune system would just like be triggered and try to act immediately and we can't tolerate those. Actually, in light of the recent coronavirus pandemic and its origins, um, have you seen a, a greater level of interest in the research that you're doing? Yeah, I think a lot of people are really interested because one of the other things that I work on is illegal wildlife trafficking. 
And that has come up repeatedly in conversation because of the implication that at the wildlife market in Wuhan was where that contact was first you know, happening in a way where it, it can then transfer over. And I think a lot of people are really now interested in this intersection between disease ecology and like infectious disease outbreaks and conservation, not just in the sense of like wildlife poaching, but also with land use change and with things that we're doing to the environment outside of just that direct contact. And even though a spot like this forest turned rice paddy looks like a perfect place for bats to forage and roost, Susan says that's not the case. People sometimes don't really connect because they're like, oh, it's green, so it's fine. Those trees there are not necessarily useful for the native wildlife. They're actually going to be used for you know, human consumption later on. And that, that land, that space is also very much interacting with humans in a way that doesn't necessarily encourage wildlife to go in there. And educating the local residents about her work helps Susan do her job and preserves wild bat populations. So in Western Indonesia, people eat them because they think that the liver can cure them. And so the reasoning that they told me is, especially if you have asthma, this is a great uh, cure for it because the, uh, the bats are you know able to fly and so their their respiratory system is really good and so like eating it will help you and the other thing that they always tell me as, as to why it's a cure all is well the bats are eating the fruits in the forest and so that means they're very healthy so if we eat the bats we're eating healthy stuff and we always have to tell them like that's not how that works but you know obviously cultural beliefs are really difficult to dislodge sometimes and learning how to coexist with bats will not only help them but help us as well a lot of the problems that we see often come from us creating situations like that. And we also don't invest enough money in doing like preventative um, research. So what happens is we end up having a pandemic and we don't know where to target our resources. I'm Andrew Falzone for Urban U. That's our show for this month. But before we go, recently we showed you BMCC Music Department's virtual choir project that would bring unity and healing to people during these trying times. Here's a look at what came out of that project. Remember to follow us on social media and take care.